Hello, everyone. Hey, Cody. Hey, I've got a, I can't stay on very long. So I just wanted to, uh, since this is my last official town hall meeting uh, as president, I just wanted to thank everyone for being involved this last year and wish everyone a very happy American Pharmacist Month. And I hope we can all celebrate in St. Louis in a couple of weeks. So fire up. Absolutely, fire up for pharmacy. <laughs> all right. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Cody. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. We'll get started with a, <clears throat> a couple of um, opening slides and information, and then we'll get to our main program. So again, welcome everyone to our October program. If you are new with us, again, just make sure to keep your microphone or your phone on mute. If you're on your phone, you can unmute with star six. Um, you can hit Zoom to raise your hand and use the chat function. And uh, this is an open discussion. As Cody already stated, this is American Pharmacist Month. So happy American Pharmacist Month to everyone. And thank you for everything that you and your pharmacy team does each and every day. I know uh, we need to take more than a month to do this. It needs to be something we thank everyone every day for. Um, just quickly on statistics, um, we, we're unfortunately leading the world in the wrong way again on COVID still, and I think that's where we'll be staying. Um, but, you know, we continue to have more and more people vaccinated. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting closer, but we're still far away from our goal of getting herd immunity. Um, but we're continuing to make progress um, with, despite um, the continued barriers of misinformation. Illinois is starting to turn the tide a little bit when it comes to um, infection rates and ICU bed um, need, but we're still not out in nowhere near out of the woods yet. Um, specifically in regions four and five and the southern part of region three for the public health region. So central and southern Illinois are still um, are still experiencing significant COVID caseloads. Um, it was really good um, to see as we start to look at um, this next slide that um, capacity for ICU beds has gone up, especially in the lower areas. It was good to see Region Five with the Southeast um, Illinois. Um, Southeast Illinois was, as most of you know, um, the last couple of weeks, of uh, last half of September was basically at zero ICU beds, and they are up now to 14. Um, hopefully that number continues to grow. Um, this is just a reminder for you and for your patients that they can um, get on to Verify Vax or Vax Verify, excuse me, which is the um, portal for eye care. Uh, for you to get your immunization record. So it's idphportal.illinois.gov. And just the statistics for Illinois, as you can see, if at least one dose we have of the 12 plus population, we have 80% of the population. Um, in Il for those 65 and older, we, at least with one dose, we have 96%. I think this is we're really starting to make some good strides here. Now, of course, this doesn't even factor in any of the additional dose and booster doses. And I, I'm i glad they're not messing these statistics up with that right now um, as we continue to evaluate that special populations right now. Um, we, we all know that um, the FDA is to hear, I think it's later, Early next week, Moderna and Johnson and Johnson's cases for uh, the data. I think it's like the fifteenth and the sixteenth, and then I think it's the following week that um, they're they're looking at additional. Um, I think it was pediatric um, doses too. So as you see here, here's the state's inventory on vaccines and then how it's spread out. Community partners is what pharmacies are under. Um, so you see a significant part of the vaccine uh, inventory load is still through um, the uh, uh, community and ambulatory care pharmacy programming. 
That would also include some of the long-term care pharmacies as well. And, um, and then you can see that we're still having unusable vaccine doses. And um, I really appreciate pharmacies that I know that are um, working really hard with patients that, you know, you want to vaccinate when they're, you know, they've come to be, they've come to ask to be vaccinated. But I do know that some pharmacies are trying to manage so that they're not wasting a full vial. And I completely understand and appreciate that. I still think it's really weird that we're this far into this stage of the pandemic and Pfizer and Moderna are completely ignorant about not creating a smaller vial. Um, I think at this point, moving it, the, the fact that we don't have unit dose um, capability of, of one of them right now um, is very surprising. This is just a reminder. Um, one of the issues that has come up from public health and um, specifically some of the encounters that they've had with pharmacies and also with public health departments. I'm not gonna put any, not all the blame on pharmacy on this, but there have been some patients who have been unnecessarily denied or inappropriately denied um, an additional dose or a booster dose because of confusion of who qualifies for what. And so this is just an example of the siren notice that went out. Um, we had worked with public health and suggested that they issue a siren notice to all vaccine providers that basically spelled out everything because they wanted us just to re-educate. I'm like, it needs to come from the department and we can help with supporting it. And so si the department issued this siren notice. It went out last Friday. Um, we sent it out um, through IPHA VaxFax on Monday as an additional reminder. Um, so please do take time. It's only two pages. Please do take time and read it because if you can help understand and you know understand and master this knowledge right now on the difference between the additional doses and the booster doses, this will help once we add in Moderna and or Johnson & Johnson into this. I'm going forward because they will be placed into whatever um, those decisions are by the FDA and the CDC. As a reminder, I have forgot, I did not get this all um, updated, but the Illinois Pharmacy Laws and Regulations Manual, the 2021 edition is available. Starlin is um, uh, modeling it for you on, on her screen, if you can see her camera. It is a significant increase in page numbers from the last volume. It's near 1,200 pages of laws and regulations just from an Illinois perspective. And um, unfortunately, for those who didn't uh, take advantage of it during September, and Starla's showing her um, gymnastics ability here with balancing it on her head. And um, the, if you didn't take advantage of the 30% offer during um, September, um, sorry that that offer has ended, but between now and the end of the year, it's still available for 20% off. So you see this um, website link up here. It says LexisNexis slash IL Pharma 30. Just make it IL Pharma 20. And you should still, and that applies both to the, um, the print version and the ebook version. So the first time ever we have the law manual available as an ebook. And um, so I do recommend you at least get one of those and this will be something that we'll be updating on a yearly basis. And um, you, it, and I'm not gonna fault you if you try the 30 and if you can get it to work, hey, go for it. Um, IPHA wins either way. So <laughs> um, I just wanna make sure that everyone has it available to them. <coughs> and lastly, before I turn it over to our, um, our special speaker this evening, um, please make sure you're signed up for conference. We're just a little over two weeks away. Um, we've got a good number of people that have signed up. Um, I'm glad to see that we have over 200 people already um, registered, which you know isn't too bad. We're always a very last minute registration conference. That's just kind of how pharmacists work and we understand that. So please do sign up. The only thing I will tell you right now I would sign up tonight and I would sign up for your hotels tonight because the Cardinal game has started. And if they win, 
those hotel prices will go up significantly tonight. I can guarantee it. Um, and they have been working the Hilton. I got to give them credit. They have been working with some of our members that we've heard um, that have called trying to get into the block. And uh, but we can't guarantee that you the pricing availability that we had has expired. Um, so please do take advantage of that. Now we do know that prices have been floating around between. 2.30 all the way up to 3.30 per night for the hotel room. So please do uh, book sooner than later. Um, but I'm, we're really looking forward to having everyone there. Our exhibitors are very excited to see you. And I know we're going to have a wonderful time for our first in-person meeting in well over a year. And um, I'm really looking forward to it. All right. Tonight, we're, we are honored to uh, have with us tonight one of our longtime members, Avery Spunt, who um, most of you who, who know. And Avery is, as we all know, loves the history of pharmacy. And we asked him if he would share with us, since this is American Pharmacist Month, um, some review of some of the key points of Illinois pharmacy history. And so I'm just going to mute and set back and let Avery take us through the um, annals of history when it comes to Illinois pharmacy. Garth looks like he's uh, muted still. Oh, let me get you unmuted here, Avery. I'm dying to hear about the history of pharmacy from Dr. Spond. Quinn. There you go, Avery. You're unmuted. You should be good okay. to go. Okay. Well, thank you very much for getting one of the fossils of pharmacy to talk to you tonight about the history of pharmacy. And I'm humbled that you're listening to me and not to the Cardinals game. But I understand if you want to check the score, have at it. We'll start today and talk a little bit about pharmacy history in general, and then specifically what the practice was in the state of Illinois. And it's best to start out with the often quoted phrase, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And as we go through decades and decades of Illinois pharmacy, you see this occur all the time and you will continue to see this occur. So let's start our journey uh, back in colonial times. Uh, the settlers came from Europe and there were apothecaries, druggists in Europe. They came from England, France, Germany, and other countries. And they brought their own specialties. The practice of pharmacy was a little bit different in each one of these countries. And they all came and melded together in the new country. However, colonial pharmacy was very disorganized. It was a, there was no educational system, even for the youngins, uh, poor educational system. There were no public schools and there were lack of private schools for the poor. Pharmacy education in colonial times was apprenticeship. It was seven years of service uh, from ages usually 14 to 21, and the master brought the apprentice in and was expected to teach him basic reading, writing, arithmetic, and the secrets of being an apothecary. And as you see, even as education improves, the philosophy of apprenticeship continues all through the history. It continued all the way back when I started in pharmacy when I was 17 years old, back in 19, uh, that was actually 1963, Starlin. Starlin. Uh, I actually received a pharmacy apprentice license and it says on their apprentice pharmacist. And that continued for a long time until they finally got rid of it. And we have pharmacy technicians and pharmacy students. So there was seven years and Again, there, 
there were all kinds of, of, of terms. And this apprenticeship really started causing a, a, a problem for, for anybody that wasn't a white male, because white males could get in, become apprentices, and did that. If you were a woman, nobody would take you in as an apprentice or if you were a person of color. So there started the behind lagging in numbers for women and people of, of color. Our situation even gets more complicated in that the first medical school was started in 1765. The first pharmacy school, not until 1821. There was not a perceived need that apothecaries, druggists, pharmacists, whatever you want to call them, needed an education at that time. The apprenticeship was what needed to exist. And they were thought not as professionals, as professional men, again, heavy emphasis on men, but rather business people, that it was a peddler of commodities. Again, as we move through, very disorganized. Medicines were substandard and many were adulterated. Around 1821, uh, people were protesting these poor standards. And a bunch of druggists and apothecaries in Philadelphia assembled to form a pharmacy organization. And their pharmacy organization uh, was to start the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, which is now the University of Science and Philadelphia College of Pharmacy. So their first school was started in 1821. It was a two-year program. Uh, there was the first education for anybody in the country. And then the practice continued and it was continued to be disorganized. In 1852, a group, a group of pharmacists got together from all over the new land to form an organization, which was the American Pharmaceutical Association, started in 1852. It's pretty amazing how you could get together and have a meeting of pharmacists in 1852. No Facebook, no Twitter, no, no actually, US mail, the telegraph wasn't available yet. Somehow they communicated, somehow they all came together in Philadelphia and start the APHA. And their mission was to get standards for pharmacy education, standards for apprenticeship, get rid of poor quality of medications, and have better communications between druggists, apothecaries, and chemists. And finally, follow the APHK Code of Ethics, which further down the line we will see causes major problems as the practice changes in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Again, to join APHA, must be of good character, support APHA constitution, and follow the APHA code of ethics. The next five colleges of pharmacy opened before the Civil War were in 1823 in Boston, 29 in New York, 1841 in Baltimore, 1850 in Cincinnati, and 1859 in Chicago, being the Chicago College of Pharmacy. It was a heck of a time to try to open a college of pharmacy, given that two years later, the Civil War tore the country apart. After the Civil War, the college reorganized and they were able to carry on their mission until 1871, when the college totally burnt down in the Chicago fire. They finally were reorganized with the help of Albert Eber, who's a legend in, in Illinois pharmacy and in national pharmacy. Uh, he was able to procure supplies and equipment and books 
to reopen and get the college going. And their initial objectives were to advance the art and science of pharmacy, to establish just principles and relations between apothecaries, druggists, and physicians, and to improve the members, their assistants and apprentices by cultivating and diffusion of scientific knowledge. Those precepts, excuse me, those precepts were wonderful. Unfortunately, it took 20 years to get enough apothecaries and druggists to support those goals. And it culminated in 1869 uh, in an APHA meeting in Chicago, started working on a model pharmacy practice act. The first concept of National Pharmacy Practice Act really was in 1869. Uh, the leaders of CCP and leading pharmacy leaders drafted a bill to regulate pharmacy and they were able to bring it to Springfield and it was entered, but it was never read. Sound familiar, Garth? <laughs> never read. So, so the bill died and it took uh, a little bit longer until 1879 when an independent, there were two journals in 1879 in, in Illinois. The first one was The Druggist, which was produced by an independent writer and entrepreneur. And he opined that there needed to be a regulation, there needed to be laws for pharmacy in the state of Illinois. And the other was called The Pharmacist, which was a CCP, Chicago College of Pharmacy journal, which also advocated you have to have legislation. There was enough pressure that they finally came together. And in 1880, the Illinois Pharmacists Association was born. Also at the same time that IPHA came to fruition, we got the first legislation to regulate the practice of pharmacy. Included in the legislation was needing to figure out who in the heck was practicing pharmacy in the state of Illinois. So they had a registration period and they were pharmacists that owned a store, had formal education, or had been in an, in an apprentice. And hence we get the term registered pharmacist because they all registered and were on the, the rolls as pharmacists. As I said, the first Pharmacy Act was passed with their hard work and it came into effect July, 1881. And the Board of Pharmacy came to be, that we actually back in 1881 had an independent pharmacy board. Uh, and we were on our way for legislation. In 1881 also was the first IPHA meeting. First IPHA meeting in 1881 wasn't that dissimilar from the meeting that you're gonna be having in a couple of weeks. There were scientific papers presented and what they call practical pharmacy papers, talking about compounding secrets and how to put certain chemicals together, how to improve your shop, your store, and how to improve your business. A year later in 1882, IPHA found itself in debt for the first time. They were $200 in the hole. Uh, spoiler alert, uh, it won't be the last time and they survived. In 1883, the state of medicine still was disorganized and pharmacists had to put up with all kinds of nonsense. And the association tried to work dealing with traveling medicine shows 
door-to-door -door peddlers and discount sellers. Pharmacists were dealing with more varieties of patent medications being produced and sold. And their inventory went up and their profit margin went down, which is a continuous theme for the next 100 years or so. And as the pharmacy meetings progressed in 1894, the IPHA directed their attention to the entertainment features of the meeting, that there had to be all kinds of leisure activities and diversions. And also in 1884, believe it or not, they had vendors show up and they gave away products, things like cologne and chewing gum and fly paper and all kinds of stuff. And at the meeting, they played horseshoes and darts and they gave away prizes. They were donated by jobbers. Probably if ballpoint pens were invented by then, they'd probably give those away, would have given those away too. Okay, as we move on, the Chicago College of Pharmacy starts to struggle uh, financially. Uh, registrations are down, economics, things like that. And in 1895, uh, actually, it was 1888. They actually offered the Chicago College of Pharmacy, the original one, to the Illinois Pharmacists Association to run the college. So that IPHA, with all its other stuff that they had to do, would also be running the only college of pharmacy in the state. Uh, the powers that be of the association decided not to take over the Chicago College of Pharmacy and declined the offer. And in 1895, the college uh, was incorporated into the University of Illinois and became the University of Illinois College of Pharmacy. Interesting, as a side note, as I digress from my digressions, the Chicago College of Pharmacy wasn't the only pharmacy school in the state and not the only one to close. In, from 1886 to 1917, Northwestern University had a college of pharmacy. It was founded by David Dyke, a, pra a practicing pharmacist, mayor of Evanston, and a member of the board of trustees of Northwestern University. Uh, the School of Northwestern opened its doors and was placed under control of the university and graduated many students until June of 1917 when they fell into hard times. And then they also incorporated with the University of Illinois. You hear a lot about CCP, but you don't hear about Northwestern that much. But just as colleges of pharmacy opened, Colleges of pharmacy can close if enrollments go down and economic hard times take over, which may be something in the future that we will see. As a side note, for anybody that's a college football fan and is old enough to remember Northwestern Stadium, uh, football stadium, it was called Dyke Stadium. It was after a pharmacist uh, who did a lot for the university. Uh, however, a gentleman by the name of Ryan uh, from the Anon Corporation gave $10 million uh, back in 1997. And they changed the name. They got rid of Dyke and it is now Ryan Stadium. Of course, it was probably a pretty good move for Northwestern considering last week, uh, the Ryans gave $450 million to Northwestern, the largest contribution to any college, uh, university. 
and probably their total amount of donations to the university was about seven hundred thousand seven hundred million dollars, almost two thirds of a billion dollars. Hey Avery, so, what do the Ryans do? They own that's the Aon, they own two independent insurance companies. Oh that all you had to say was Aon, yes, which does yeah. hire pharmacists for their health management. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying anything, just making a comment. I was disappointed that a pharmacist lost its naming rights. But yeah, and, and for some reason, I his first name is eluding me now. But anyways, let's go back to, to Illinois, just straight Illinois pharmacy. Illinois pharmacy back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, sees more organizations forming nationally the national association of retail druggists locally the chicago retail druggists association and from that time on ipha apha crda and arda uh, have different viewpoints and hinder legislation for the practice of pharmacy moving Moving right along as the pharmacy wars continue and try to find unification, which eludes us. World War I happens. And unfortunately, pharmacists are not recognized as professional men and are not officers in the practice of pharmacy during World War I. What's even more terrible is that fought World War II and pharmacists didn't have recognition. There were no pharmacy officers. It didn't take place until the early 1950s that there were pharmacy officers in the various branches of the military service. In the early 1900s, a gentleman comes up from Dixon, Illinois, totally broke, and he needs a job. Uh, he had apprenticed down in Dixon, and he was clerking there, but he got fired for not shoveling snow. So without any money, he comes up to Chicago and tries to find a job. The gentleman's name is Charles Walgreens. Uh, he uh, gets a job, works his hours, takes the board exam, and the Spanish-American War starts, and he enlists in the in the army, goes goes to Cuba. Uh, he can't he contracts yellow fever and malaria and almost dies, but he comes back. And he starts working and he works his magic. He buys his first store, 39th and Cottage Grove. And the rest of this history starts all kinds of new innovative practices in pharmacy, changes pharmacy. And I won't make an evaluation, but incorporated malted milk, mass advertising, delivery service, photo finishing and cosmetics. And that's why for so many times they confuse a pharmacist with the soda jerk. Uh, one of the things that Walgreens did ascribe to is having the best possible customer service. He's probably rolling over in his grave now, but oh, all comments are mine, not of the association. So get that on tape. Okay, so while, while the First World War was going on, our friends in Springfield were doing what they always do, conniving. Uh, they passed the Civil Administrative Code, 
which combined numerous state organizations, literally wiping out all the independent boards and created the Department of Registration and Education, which is the precursor to professional regulations now, but it was Department of r &E, and it eliminated autonomous boards. It eliminated the Autonomous Board of Pharmacy, which never was to be again. And I think that's one of the most disastrous things that ever happened to the practice of pharmacy in the state of Illinois, not having an aut autonomous board of pharmacy, just one person's point of view. And with the elimination of the board of pharmacy, uh, it fell into the hands of uh, unscrupulous politicians. In, in 1920, and the board of pharmacy was, was gotten rid of, but they had some dedicated pharmacists that still wrote the pharmacy exam. And on the eve of the exam of 1922, they found out that the exam was compromised, that one of the politicians in r &E had the questions not only for the pharmacy board, but for the medical board and was selling the questions. Well, this the examiners wrote new questions, a new exam. The next day, the applicants walked in, they were given the exam, they looked at it and half of them got up and walked out. Uh, following that, there were indictments and people went to jail for it. Uh, moving along, after that, from 1920 to 1933, prohibition hit. And except for the illegal speakeasies, the neighborhood bars closed. Somebody just made a comment. They rewrote the exam overnight. Yeah, it wasn't as difficult as it is now. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so 1920 to 1933, Prohibition, the corner drugstore with its soda fountain became the place to gather. And there was plenty of alcohol in pharmacies uh, because they were sold for medicinal use. So there was plenty of fake RXs written for alcohol. And as later in the 20s, as the depression hit, uh, people were selling alcohol illegal in the, in the pharmacies. Moving, moving along, in 1929, the Great Depression, the stock market crashes, IPHA loses all of its money. Spoiler alert, it survives, but it did lose all of its money. 1932, University of Illinois interest, introduces the four-year curriculum. And in 1936, Joseph J. Sign, Shine, S-H-I-N-E, is the full, first full-time secretary of IPHA. It's actually equivalent to the elect executive director, but they refer to as secretary. And Garth, I'm glad they changed the name for you because I wouldn't like you to tell people you were secretary. I've been called uh, a lot of things over the years. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding, buddy. Anyways, so he became the first executive and their offices were at 77 West Washington. The Second World War had started and went through and it was hard times for pharmacists. They had decreased stock supply shortages, rationing of traveling gas. Social and professional events were limited to 50 people there, because gas was rationed and travel was rationed. But IPHA still had its annual meeting. Uh, they had a meeting in 1942, 1943. And in 1944, their keynote speaker was Hubert H. Humphrey. Now, some of you folks may not be old enough to remember or didn't study your history that Hubert H. Humphrey, a pharmacist uh, turned politician, was vice president of the United States 
under Lyndon Bean Johnson. But I thought it was pretty impressive that they had him speaking in 1944. 1945, the war ends and the troops come home. Colleges under the GI Bill have record enrollment, including colleges of pharmacy. At the University of Illinois, two real heroes are included in that group that we know of. There were plenty, probably many, many more, but a gentleman named Robert Bogash uh, was with the 101st Airborne and landed the first day of D-Day at Normandy. And Milton Christie, uh, who was a US Marine, was a Carlson Raider. If you ever want to read stories, check out the Carlson Raiders. How did that group many future leaders uh, developed in, in the practice of pharmacy? And with the end of World War II, the end of the Depression, the landscape of merchandising totally changed. People had more money. There was a demand for services, for goods. People were moving to the suburbs, started the birth of baby boomers, malls, mega stores, and mega stores with pharmacies inside started the trend, not only of chain drug stores, but pharmacies and in, in, in mega stores. Pharmacists were still dealing with issues no dissimilar from those back in 1870. But here we were dealing with doctor dispensing, mail order, union closed pharmacies, uh, and manufacturer and science was exploding, discovering drugs, inventory was going up, and less and less compounding was being done. Okay, I'm gonna, so the 60s were turbulent times. Not only were they turbulent times on college campuses for numbers of reasons, they were also turbulent times for IPHA. The 60s, most members were owners or managers. Pharmacy practice were, was changing. Uh, they were younger, more aggressive, more pro progressive, wanting to change the profession people and starting to try to get involved. And in 1962, there was a slate of candidates backed by the association and the secretary by the name of Vitney, V-R-A-T-N-Y. And all his candidates were defeated. A, a, a group of that was put up, that was against the established association, was put up. Uh, it was a split in the organization. People left. Legal counsel was changed. And these folks started to come in and started working in the organization. But the good news was is that they were open to other folks affiliating with IPHA. And from that time, different regional and local groups were given a seat at the IPHA table. ICHP was recognized and given a seat at, at the table. And in 1962, Richard Stroman was hired as the executive director. At the time that he was hired, the Association Journal was called Drug Progress. There was the IPHA Journal, Drug Progress. He was responsible for changing the title to Illinois Pharmacist. So Illinois Pharmacist was born in 1962. Uh, there were more and more fighting. There, there was uh, more and more executive directors. Uh, Stroman had a, was offered a job at AP, ACPE and went. Roger Kane took over. And then after that, Alan Granite was the executive director. And unfortunately, he died way too young in office. But in 1976, IPHA office opened in Springfield. 
around the same time, 1961, the Southern Illinois Society of Hospital Pharmacists was created. And a year later, the Northern Illinois Society was formed. They later combined for the Illinois Council of Health System, the Illinois Council of Hospital Pharmacists. And that was all put together, was all the hard work of Sister Mary Louise Degenhart. Uh, we don't have time for it, but the impact of nuns, sisters on the practice of pharma pharmacy is legendary, including our dear friend, Sister Margaret. Uh, but if you ever want to read something, read about the impact of nuns in the practice of pharmacy. Is I was talking about the disgruntledness that people were coming now, they had, they had five-year degrees uh, and that five-year degree was a compromise. Dean Webster from the University of Illinois proposed a PharmD degree as early as 1950, but they weren't ready for it. So it was a compromise of a five-year BS degree. And in the 60s, there were some young, hard to look at them as radicals, but they were radical to the profession back there. Uh, Robert Murtak, Dan Nona uh, at the university, and I'm sure they had their equivalents in St. Louis, uh, were starting this radical clinical pharmacy movement. Uh, they started it, and at the same time, at Moffitt Hospital out in California, two people, one on day shift and one on night shift, started the Ninth Floor Project, which was a satellite pharmacy at Moffitt Hospital. The two people uh, were Eric Herfindill and Mary Ann Coda, who probably dragged their books around through pharmacy school. Herfindill and Coda later married Kimball and became Coda Kimball. So they started that project uh, Herb Carlin at Illinois, and then later with Richard Hutchinson were brought in and the clinical movement started in Illinois. Uh, Henry Manassi was then able to push the PharmD degree in. And like anything else in pharmacy, nobody could agree. And there were real disagreements to the fact that there was actually a fight between the last BS class at Illinois and the first farm D, D class. Actually, a couple of punches were thrown. But anyways, I digress again. So the farm D degree was put in, it then becomes a national degree. And pharmacy actually changes a lot because back when I was going to, went to pharmacy school in 65. Who went to pharmacy school? People that like science and math, maybe worked in a drugstore. There were 72 colleges of pharmacy. They took lots of people in and the attrition was tremendous. So a lot of people didn't want to try it because they didn't want to flunk out. Uh, but with the PharmD degree, it became a dream degree. The salary was good. You were called a doctor. Uh, people really didn't realize that only a small percentage went on to residencies and actually practiced clinically in hospitals. But a shortage developed because one year of graduates, graduations didn't occur. And the number of graduates were down and there was a big pharmacy shortage. And at the same time, more and more stores were being opened, 24 hour stores were being opened and salaries went through the roof. Uh, and with that, people were applying to pharmacy school. And people wanna know, well, how did we go from 72 colleges of pharmacy to a number I can't even count anymore? Well, because of that high salary, 
and how good the degree and the job looked, applications went up tremendously. At the time, probably in 1990, 1995, there were probably 18,000 seats for colleges of pharmacy. And there were 100,000 applications with 80% 80, 80 or 80,000 of those worthy of admission to a college of pharmacy. And when they didn't get in and they were stellar students, they started complaining. They started going to, to the state legislature, to the governor, to the senators, to the congressmen. And you know the rest of this story. The schools kept on increasing, increasing, and increasing. So that leaves us now in the modern times. And people were down on pharmacy. The hours were cut down. The technicians were cut down. But then we got hit by a world pandemic. And I got to tell you, I am so proud of the pharmacists and the job that they did and are doing, uh, fighting against disinformation, filling prescriptions, getting vaccinations. You know, so people are starting to respect pharmacists more now. If we can only pull our resources together and act as one, the fight, future will be bright and wonderful. And maybe one of you in 40 years will be giving a lecture to the organization like this. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Avery, that was so fascinating. I learned so much. I loved it. I learned something new today. Thank you very and much, you know, Avery. When they used to have cocktail parties, you'd be able to talk about all these trivial things and say, hey, did you know that Dyke Stadium was named after a pharmacist? Yeah, I was a geek or a nerd. I don't know. Anyways, thank you very much. Thank you, that was Avery. Awesome. Any, Any questions? Qu yeah. Any questions for Avery? Avery, do you have any specific thoughts on what we can do to keep the momentum going for pharmacists kind of finally being recognized as clinicians? That's a very abstract question. No, I mean, the first thing that you have to do is make sure that the pharmacists are well, that they're, that they're not burned out, that their mental health is intact, that they're not alienated by people yelling at them, screaming at them, demanding their parasite medication. Uh, you know, serious, seriously, I mean, they need, they need to be okay. And Sam and I had the same reaction. And after, you know, and after they're okay, then you need them to bring them together. And we need to be one community. You know, maybe it's a pipe dream, but it's something that I've had for 50 years that we all work together, that you don't need 20 organizations. So it's a vision. I love it. Thank you. A just you know, just I mean, labeling it a vision. That, and I didn't mention it is that the numbers, the percentage of pharmacists joining any organization is so small. What the hell are the other, oh, excuse me, what the heck are the other 80% doing besides complaining and nothing gets done? Complaining about the complaining. What? Abby, you have your hand up, go right ahead. Hi, Avery, can you hear me okay? Hey, Abby, how are you How doing? are you? Good. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Um, no one can do this presentation except for you. Could you tell the audience, specifically the pharmacy student, why it's important for them to build their professional and also their network within not just the National Association, but also at the Illinois Association? Well, it's contacts, relationships, 
learning from people. Uh, you go to meetings and you, you work with people. You hang around Garth and Starlin. And when you hang around with people like that and other leaders, you'll be in the room when it happens. And you want to be in the room when it happens. I'm not going to break out into song, but uh, <laughs> there really, uh, there really is what's important. And you learn from people, you meet more people, you get more responsibilities, and you become a doer and not a complainer and a sitting on the sidelines. Avery, do you remember the first time when they overhauled the NAPLEX and, and we were all brought in and locked in the ballroom to write, write questions for the NAPLEX exam? <laughs> yeah, I have more visit, vivid nightmares from when the FPGE was, uh, was shut down. Yeah, yeah, anyway. But anyways, yeah. We have stories. <laughs> Avery, there was a question in the chat. What's your favorite piece of, uh, I guess it would be pharmacy history trivia? Pharmacy piece of history trivia. <clears throat> That's a tough one. Um, Hey Avery, why don't you ask? Probably, probably, probably the funniest. Probably, it, it actually is. Um, well, there's two of them, but the first one is when I was working at the University of Illinois. Uh, I parked in the parking lot, and there was this old gentleman that was having trouble walking to the front door, and I helped him in and walked into Walgreens corporate headquarters. And we're talking, and it was very nice and everything like that. And we're walking, and all of a sudden, security surrounds us. And they want to know how I got in the building, because I was walking in with Charles Walgreens. <laughs> but that's just my personal thing. So, sorry, I don't have any others. That's cool. But um, I thought one thing that you did bring up, and this was a conversation you and I had a couple weeks ago, um anything else yeah there was one thing i thought that was really good about something you and i talked oh, about my internet connections. oh can you can you guys hear me okay okay Avery, yeah, my connection me? was unstable okay um but no this is something you and, you and i talked about a couple weeks ago was about how nabp ended up in illinois oh that i actually know that when NABP was formed, the, the, the executive directory was called secretary back then, lived in Illinois, lived in Chicago, and wasn't going to move. So they opened the office here. And that then, was then, when Car then when Carmen, you know, then when, the, when uh, his successor and Carmen, they wanted to move to the north side. So they went to Park Ridge, right? And then they needed land, and they moved to Mount Prospect. But it was—it's a—it's a very Illinois-centered organization. Absolutely, and uh, I think it's—you know—one thing I hope that everyone kind of got out of this is about how important Illinois pharmacy is to American pharmacy, and how influential we have had an impact on patients in other states and around the world. And, um, and Dennis, I thought you were unmuted um, shortly ago, and, uh, and I want to make sure you got your question or comment. Oh, Dennis, you you went, uh, your video went off. Mickey, I see you're unmuted. Go right ahead, Mickey. I, I just wanted to mention this with Avery, and he'll be very um, humble and say he didn't really do this. But when he talks about being involved and getting networking to the students, Avery is part of the reason why I am in IPHA. I'm a past president of those. I went to my first meeting to surprise a friend and congratulate him on becoming a president of IPHA. I stood in the back of the room. I was intimidated as all get out, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I was just going to go say hi, and I was going to run out the door and leave. Avery came up to me and said, oh, is this your first time here? 
And I said, yep. And he said, here, let me take you and meet some people. And I sat at a table with many, many from professors and such from school, intimidated out of my mind and introduced them, still run into them. And to this day, this is why I stayed in IPHA and part of it. And he probably will tell you it wasn't the reason, but it's part of the reason. And that networking works for people. So like if you happen to be at a meeting and you see somebody standing in the corner, go up to them and talk to them. Ask them to come with you and your friends because you never know where it's going to lead you. And if if you had asked me when I was a student, and I tell this story in Carolyn's room to say this, if you had asked me as a student and described me here I became president, I would have laughed at you and said, I think you have the wrong girl. But it, you never know. It leads you to places I've gotten to do cool things as, um, from my PHA and been in wonderful situations and have met many, many friends. And my family considers pharmacy part of their family. My kids were disappointed the first year they didn't get to go to a IPHA meeting because school interfered with it. And they were like, we don't get to go? It was like their family reunion. So I just wanted to tell Avery that and remind everybody that those do happen. So if you're at the meeting, please feel free to reach out. Dennis, go ahead. Thank you, Mickey. Well, I was just going to mention the fact when, when Hubert Humphrey's name came up, um, I believe it was 50 or 51 when I think it was the Humphrey Act was passed. And, and my understanding is that that had something to do with the initiation of actually having to have, have a prescription. You had to have prescription, had to have refills. Right. And you that can kind take of an order over the phone, you know, things that we take for granted today. Yeah, it, it kind of, the ball started rolling, at least in that direction, away from, you know, it yeah, used it to be- the Durham Humphrey Act. Yeah, it used to cut, used to have to, you know, people used to have to go to the pharmacy for bleach and things like that. And um, all of a sudden we took a big turn when that act was passed and that part of its history, but then there's all kinds of things in between. So, and I'll let it go with that. Thank you. I did put in the chat because um, Avery brought up a really good point about wellness of pharmacists. And um, when I made the slides earlier today, it was before the embargo was released on um, this press release. So the American Pharmacists Association and NASPA, we have, um, and I'm proud to have worked on this project, um, we've released a portal for uh, pharmacist workplace and well-being reporting. So pharmacists can confidentially report any issues that they have about their workplace. And we're using this information to start to gather to help build and create solutions. And so don't, don't, don't be afraid to um, report on this. We've, we've shared it throughout our social media and you'll see more and more on this, but please do share it with all your peers. Um, we really wanna make sure that we start to enact change um, we're enacting change on the legislative aspects because we know the roles of a lot of the other factors, including um, the PBM um, restrictions that are causing a lot of these well-being issues right now. So, but we need to know how we need data on the other issues so we can create the solutions. So I really appreciate everyone's help in advance for um, all of your input. Any other questions? Starlin, I see you're unmuted. Can we share now on our Facebook this link? Our yes, Facebook you can. Link? I already have it shared on our Facebook and Twitter. You can uh, share it from there if you need to. Laura, are you going to share on uh, on our women's stuff? Yeah, someone could put it in pharmacist moms, please, because I don't have access to that. And I really want to make sure they have access to this. Yeah. Avery, any last minute thoughts or comments? Oh, just thank you for giving me this opportunity. It's been a rough 18 months for a senior citizen. So I appreciate it. And I hope to see you soon, guys and gals and everybody. I appreciate it, Avery. And really thank, thank you very much um, for taking the time to pull this information together and to share it with us this evening. It was a great honor to have you this evening. And uh, I want to thank everyone again. And I will Can be I give glad. A I will can be I glad a, to, oh, sorry, go ahead, Laura. Sorry, sorry, can I just give a quick shout out to embarrass yeah. them? My Roosevelt students here, yay! 
Say hi, Roosevelt students. Yay. <laughs> okay, that's all. Dork, dork is done. Oh, no, you're good. And I'll be glad to hug, handshake, fist bump, elbow bump, whoever wants to at the IPHA conference. Um, we'll be glad to see you. The masks came in today for everyone. Um, if you didn't bring your own and uh, the bracelets that will help identify that your social awareness preferences will, should be on any day. So um, we're getting very close. You know, CE programs are being peer reviewed and booklets are being finalized. So if you know of any last minute exhibitors, we can still squeeze them in. Um, we really want to make sure, um, uh, Sam, it's not an IPHA mask, but it is a KN95. It, uh, it, it'll, help, it'll help keep you safe. <laughs> uh, I have an announcement. Charlie, go I'm for gonna, it, Charlie. Miranda, Dr. Wilhelm and I are going to need student helpers uh, for the Jeopardy. We're going to try to do socially distanced Jeopardy this year. So Mickey, are you coming? All right, so uh, we'll, we'll get that going, but if you're coming to the meeting, uh, the students control the floor so that the pharmacists don't get out of hand. So um, I'll, I'll be putting, uh, uh, I'll be sending things to your ASP about who would like to, uh, who's coming and who would like to volunteer and help us with the, the great fun of Jeopardy. Starland um, and I have already been discussing about how to um, append the rules as we may um, to make sure that Jeopardy is safe um, and just trying to, Jeopardy does get rambunctious and we want to make sure that people still stay within their, um, their comfortability zones, but uh, um, we'll, we'll be get, we'll, we'll be able to uh, make it sure it's a good kickoff. So I will, we will see everyone in about two weeks and um, everyone else will see in uh, the November town hall. Stay safe, everyone. And by the way, the Cardinals are leading. Hopefully that'll continue. Point to nothing. Bye. <laughs>